Would you like to hear from one of the greatest storytellers of our time? On today's episode, sponsored by Najahi, we have the incredible Les Brown and his awesome daughter, Ona, to share their stories, how he made it, his struggles he faced, and what he did to become, in my mind, the king of motivational speaking. Cue the music. But first of all, welcome to Dubai. I know you've been here before, but has much of it changed? Have you seen it growing even further than it was last time? You know, Dubai is always in a growth mode. There's no question about that. I saw the new museum that's being built, and I'm just fascinated with the architecture. You guys take it to the next level, whatever you do. It's incredible, isn't it? That yes, is. I've they never seen it. anything like that at all. And it's 3D printed. Wow, no. Yeah, 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 it's 3D printed. What does that mean? <laughs> the, the, the Dubai is trying to, from a sustainability point of view, to try and, and make itself more modern, okay, and use more renewable resources. Oh. And so there's a lot of cement here used with tower blocks and whatnot. So mm. they're trying to be as smart as they can. Nice. But um, yeah, so you're enjoying the city, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and so the we, people. And the people yes. are great too, aren't they? Yes. Okay, so we're cha-ching. Okay, 3.0, yeah. you've come here. Okay, Najahi have put a fantastic event on. And oh my goodness, the audience, didn't they just love you guys out there? Yeah, because they know we love them. And <laughs> it's just a very responsive audience. I could feel their energy. So they inspired and lift the old man. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you come and talk at events like this, do you find it easy to get enthusiastic and excited to inspire people because you've done it for so many years. Like, like literally, as, as long as I can ever remember, that's what you've been doing. You know, I remember, the only person I remember before you was Zig Ziglar. Yes. Wow. Okay, that's the only person that ever came into my consciousness or into my world. So after doing it for so many years, how do you get yourself motivated? 51 years. I don't have to get myself motivated. I, I, I love it. I mean, I can't believe that I'm 75. I used to think people in their 40s were old. Now <laughs> that I'm 75, I believe I was a, a waiter at the Lord's Supper. <laughs> I just say, who turned 75? It is shocking to me. But I love it. And I think that when you're in alignment with your purpose, we were not born to work for a living, but to live our purpose, and our purpose will make our living that it, 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 it's something that you look forward to doing because it's your magnificent obsession. Mm -hmm. So it's not work. It's something that I look forward to do. The only part of my business that's work is getting on an airplane. That's what I charge them for, getting on an airplane, but not to speak. I'll do that for nothing. And how do audiences differ all over the world where you've spoken? Do you, is it generally the same or are the audiences different in different ways? What have you learned? I like to totally different. It is so interesting. I was saying to dad the other day, there's something that might be hilarious in London, England. And then you say the same thing in New York or Los Angeles or Sydney, Australia. And it's like, OK, and what's your next point? <laughs> <laughs> so you just never know. And it's about feeling the audience, connecting with the audience and understanding that you don't want to have that shelf presentation approach. You always want to be do the due diligence, which I think no one does like dad. Like he asks so many questions and he di we dive into the culture. We look for things that will help us to understand what's happening, where we are and what the people are like so that we can resonate with them and not just speak from the stage of our own space, but something that is relatable and tangible and, and easy to connect with. I second that motion. Yeah. <laughs> do you know if there's another father and daughter duo that do what you do anywhere in the world? I'm trying to think. Is there I, anyone? I don't know. I've, no, I've we're never the seen first that. family of motivation. Yes. <laughs> you are. You are. Yeah. So you must be enormously proud of Ona. Yes. Come. Tell me a bit about that. Well, but here's the shocking part. Are you ready for it? She's also my coach. No, shut up. Really? <laughs> she said to me one day, Daddy, are you coachable? I'm saying to myself, I know she's not asking me. <laughs> I won the highest award from Toastmasters International, inducted into the National Speakers Hall of Fame, and selected among the top five speakers in the world. And you're going to ask me, am I coachable by you? So I said, 
yes, I am, reluctantly. <laughs> and then she pointed out something in my presentation that I've been doing for years. And I became very humble. I said, you got a point. And I made the adjustment that she told me. And it made all the difference in the world. So I said, well, will you coach me for, forever? Oh, wow. And I don't invoice them either. <laughs> <laughs> But I think this is a good point. I want to bring this out because yeah, I think yeah, totally. Spencer can do something with this. Because I, I love your mind, the way it thinks, right? So dad used to say in his presentation for years that one of the hardest things that he did, one of the easiest things he ever did was to earn a million dollars. One of the hardest things he ever did was to believe it could happen to him. And so I said in the coaching, I said, Dad, when you say it could happen to you, it's almost as if you're positioning as if you won the lotto. There's no ownership. I said, it didn't happen to you. You studied, you, you journaled, you, you did the work, you went to workshops, you took training, you, you went to stages and spoke for sometimes chicken dinners. Mm. Like you paid dues and you had this vision that you built and developed. And so it's not that it happened to you, it's that the easiest thing you ever did was to earn a million dollars. The hardest thing you ever did was to believe that you could do it. Mm. He said, whoa. Yes. And That's then he real. shifted. He never said that again. But he had been saying that for years and no one caught it. A lot of people don't, don't identify with that either, do they? It's kind of like yeah. the apprenticeship as you yeah. go through it. They don't realize what they're learning along the way. Right. And also a lot of people don't feel like they're worth it. Right. They don't feel like they have any inherent value. And so because they don't feel they have a value, they can't always believe what's possible. Does that make sense to you? Totally. Yes. It, the, the area of feeling deserving is so major, particularly if you live in a culture where you've been mon marginalized and your sense of self has been destroyed. There's a guy named Richard Wright who wrote, he was a very profound thinker and poet. He said, the impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experiences of life. Mm -hmm. and, and because of what he went through, he wrote a book called the invisible man, that he had lost his sense of self and, and he didn't even think about dreaming because of life was so brutal to him to keep him down. And, and so there are so many people around the world, I'm looking at things on television about slavery and, 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 and people being kidnapped and sex slaves and oh, all these yeah. types of things. Uh, dehumanization is, is more prevalent now than ever before. Oh, yes, we have just exposed to the information on it. Right. And so we have a lot of work to do. And, and the, in the work that we're doing, my goal is, I, I believe that we should speak to bring life and to, to give hope because when there's hope in the future, it gives you power, power in, the, in present. the present. And that we are very fortunate to, to, to be here and to be able to still make a difference, to build a legacy. Uh, we feel that evil prevails when good men and women do nothing. Mm. And so we see speaking from a perspective that is cause-centered. I believe it's been hijacked by speaking to sell. But I believe that when you speak, you distract, dispute, and inspire how people live their lives as a result of the story they believe about themselves. And so you distract them from that story. Through the execution of your speaking, you, you create an experience that allow them to begin to see themselves differently, to get out of their history into their imagination. You expand their minds, you touch their heart and ignite their spirit. And they leave there being, as Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God and start writing a new chapter in their lives. That's really profound to me. Uh, Tony Robbins was talking to me about Operation Underground Railroad with the children and the people that are brought out of sex slavery. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what they do. And that that's the fastest growing criminal network in the world. Mm. Yes. And those people that have been exposed to that and experienced that, first of all, don't look at what the future looks like. They just dwell on the scenario and the environment that they've been involved with. And they do need to be inspired. They, they do need to, as you just described it there just beautifully, you know, ignite that fire back in them because there's a lot of people that have gone through a lot of tough times. Yes. And yes. You know, a lot of us 
don't we don't we don't remember how lucky we are a lot of the times we take for granted don't we and we dwell on our sorrows mm -hmm. and these types of people that come from that place and build again okay are always going to need support and people yes. like you i believe give that inspiration to people i mean think about it those motivational videos that you see on youtube Mm -hmm. One in a million doesn't have your voice on. <laughs> <laughs> Every, all of the others do. They, they're, they're, they're you. And, and so your voice moves people, okay? Yes. It impregnates people in some part of their body, their mind somehow, okay? And makes them want to charge forward. And that's a very powerful and strong place to be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that who you are behind the words that you speak, when I'm training speakers, and that's where my life is now, you learn, you earn, you pass it on. And when I'm working with speakers, I say to them, who you are behind the words are far more important than the words that you speak. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important. We first work on the messenger and then on the message. Mm -hmm. I'm merely an inspirational speaker for a Jewish carpenter, but that's another conversation, <laughs> all right? So, but, but self-development that, we have people speaking and inspiring people to live their dreams and they haven't done anything. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely, I agree. So, so you, you want to raise the bar on yourself. You want to be the example. You want to be the message. You want to be congruent with the words that you're speaking. Don't practice what you preach, but preach what you practice. That's awesome. Now, money and purpose. Mm -hmm. I think people get these two aspects twisted sometimes people are focused on trying to make money rather than focused on trying to serve mm. yeah sometimes then people people focus on money because they don't understand what their purpose is right or how even to find their purpose how do you deal with that when you're talking to people mm -hmm. i talk with people about what resonates with you but also about the fact that there's something that i read in the what i call my favorite book all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. I see this as a calling. A calling is something that you love so much, you do it for nothing. And you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. Mm -hmm. I gave many, many speeches that I never got paid for. Dr. Martin Luther King gave the speech, I have a dream over 200 times before he spoke at the Washington Monument. Did he? Yes. I didn't know that. Speakers speak. And I tell speakers, listen, if this is who you are, this is what you love to do, you don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to, to be, be great. great. Speak. Do you remember, do you, Anna, do you remember your first ever speaking gig? Do you remember that? How yes, you because set, set I remember dad tricked me and I shared this in, <laughs> in the conference about, he said you, he knew I wasn't going to just get on stage and speak because I told him I'm not a speaker, I'm shy, I'm introvert. So he said, okay. He realized I wasn't going to back down. So he used the wisdom and he said, you don't have to speak. I just want you to just get on stage and tell a story because you tell a great story. And I said, well, I do tell a pretty good story now. <laughs> he said, well, would you be willing to just get on stage and tell a story? You ain't got to speak or nothing. I said, okay, I'll tell a story, but I'm not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and I still can't believe he tricked me with that. And so that's how I saw it in my mind was me just telling a story. And I'm known as the message midwife. I help people to give birth to their unique message that they want to share with the world. And I, I believe that the more voices that are lifted up and people that find their unique voice, their unique story, and they bring it out to the world, the better the world will be. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. And it's interesting because there's so many unique voices that have different journeys and ethnicities and challenges and pains that they are able to reach people in different ways. There are people that you can reach that dad and I will never be able to reach and vice versa. Mm. So it's all about us finding our own unique way to, to share our story and our voice. And notice I had three females on the stage today. Yeah. When I came into the speaking industry, no one looked like me. 67% of the audiences were female and no females on the stage. And so I said, when I make it, 
I'm going to train female speakers and I'm going to have them on my stage. And, and, and the goal is, is to, to realize that women have voices too and been silenced for so many years, been marginalized and still is to a very large extent and helping women to find their voices. Ona has done that very successfully and, and she helped me to find my voice because I thought that I knew and there's a quote I remember from high school that you never find out how much you know until you realize how little you know. <laughs> and so I'm so humbled that my daughter teach me, but I teach you're never too old to learn and you, you're never too young to teach. And so to have more females on the stage, now we got the yin and the yang. We have now different perspectives, different mindsets, and different deliveries of messages that I think that can provide more impact and provide more value for audiences. I think you're right. Interestingly enough, when I host these types of events, it's women that come up to me and say to me, oh, how, do I get, how do I get on that stage? I would love to do that. Guys don't, but ladies do. Interesting. And so it's, the it's guys little, yeah, don't. The guys don't, but the ladies Because they do. have guys up there already to look at. Oh, got it. The ladies yes. want to get the ladies want to get on the stage, and 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 again, a lot of the time, we're a little bit like you when when you knew we were videoing this podcast, yeah. Yes, like, yeah. Is that, how do I look? Right. Okay. Right. Where guys, it's just kind of like you know, I, I'm a guy, so when my hair was done first thing this morning, it stays the same the whole day. Right. <laughs> and so ladies worry more about what they look, and so I suppose there's presentation on stage as well that they're considered. But women want to be on stage; they they, they want more so than ever, I believe, to get their voices heard. Mm -hmm. And I think all of my businesses are run by women. Mm, okay? okay, because I think they're better organized, better structured. I agree. Okay? I, I find it much easier. I also come from a strong mother. My parents got divorced when I was seven and mm -hmm. my dad went bankrupt and my mum had to bring us all up, you know, she wow. had three jobs. And so I've been surrounded by this strength in women leaders, essentially, just in my small community of my house. Mm -hmm. And so when I see women want to do it, I really want them to take another step. Okay, I really want them to kind of get stuck in and do it and not feel like it's too overwhelming and too tough. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's where they get to though. I want to be there, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to that, get there. That, that I'm worth being there or I, I, I can get there. Yeah. I think one of the things that's very challenging for women, since I'm the yeah. woman here, you the woman here. <laughs> I can speak on behalf of women, is that we, we naturally nurture others. And it's it's almost almost innate to put others up and to put them forward, and it's a part of our makeup. And so when I when Dad and I spoke before three thousand Jordanians when we were in Jordan, it was interesting to have women came come up and say, "Now after hearing your voice, I know that I can be a good woman of God, a great wife." a great mother, but still have a dream. And so oftentimes I've worked with women, powerful women that basically let go of their dream in honor of being an amazing mom or an amazing wife or a great daughter. There's so many times when I wanted to serve my dad and I didn't want to necessarily go do what I was called to do in my own business. So that's the thing that we as women, I think, often struggle with. And so finding a way to give to others and still celebrate yourself, still put the oxygen on yourself first. When they used to say that on planes, I was like, these people are crazy. They're cold blooded. I'm not going to have elders and children struggle. I'm going to help them first. And then finally, <laughs> one day it dawned on me, Ona, if you lose consciousness, you can't help anyone. Right. So that, why are you laughing at me in the interview? I'm not. So anyway, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. So okay. I said, okay, I'm going to follow what they say. I will actually put the oxygen on me first. So when I talk to women, I say, put the oxygen on yourself. It's not selfish. It's not mean. You're not cheating anyone. When you're at your highest, when you're at your best, that's when you give the best to everyone around you, your your family, your community, your vision, your goals and your dreams. That's fantastic. Like really fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you for that. <laughs> Les, um, there's one story that I listened to many years ago 
and I have listened to it recently again. And even though I watched your, your interview with Tom Billy really on the yes. Impact Theory, which was fantastic. Thank you. I, it, genuinely, it was. The depth of that interview, I learned more about you then than I think I'd learnt about you before because of the questions that he was asking you. It was gen were you there? Yeah, I was it there. Was genuinely, <laughs> that was just a, a, a world-class conversation between two guys that were clearly very intelligent and, and willing and open to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But the story that makes me always smile and it always warms my heart was when you got the job at the radio station. Yeah. And, and, and it just, because it reminded me of me when I was a kid, you know, facing rejection. Yes. And how I dealt with that. Would you just share that story for my listeners? <laughs> Are you serious? I love it so much. It, I mean, you, it was just such oh a great. Oh, oh my God. Spencer, <laughs> are you serious? I just want well, to give the overview well, of the Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I wanted to get a job at a radio station. And I was looking for a way to make it possible to earn enough money to buy my mother a home. And so this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, he gave a recommendation for me because he, he spoke to me and changed my life. I, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded in school. And he told me that someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And, and that interrupted the vision that I had of myself. And so he asked me, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to buy my mother a home. He said, how do you plan to do that? I said, I'd like to be a disc jockey. He says, very good, here's my card. Go to WMBM radio station on Miami Beach and tell Milton Butterball Smith, I sent you there. I trained him. I said, yes, sir. I went to the radio station. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, I'd like to be a disc jockey. And he said, uh, do you have any experience? I said, no, sir, I don't. You, you don't have any experience in broadcasting, in journalism? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, I'm sorry, we don't have any job for you. I was devastated with rejection. I went back and I told Mr. Washington, I said, Mr. Washington, they said, no. He said, don't take it personally. Go back again, you gotta be hungry. He said, some people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. So I went back again. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir, I'd like to be a disc jock. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here yesterday? I said, yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you back today? Sir, I, I didn't know whether or not someone was laid off or someone was fired, sir. No, nobody was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was seeing him for the first time. Hello, Mr. Vaudeville, how are you, sir? My name is Les Froud, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, weren't you here the last two days? I said, yes, sir. Then why are you back today? Sir, I, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Don't you come back here again. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy like I was seeing you for the first time. Hello, Mr. <laughs> Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage and said, go get me some coffee. And I said, yes, yes sir. sir. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and so I learned something from that experience about persistence. You know, Augmentino said, persist until you succeed. And so I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I teach people, give before you ask. Mm -hmm. I would serve them. I'd get their lunch and their dinner, and I'd stand in a control room, watch them memorize their hand movements, and I visualized myself being behind the microphone, knowing my time will come. And then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one at the radio station. And a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. And I was looking at him through the control room window, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. <laughs> I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock. I'd go and get him some more if he'd asked me to. <laughs> And then pretty soon the phone rang. It was a general manager. I said, hello. He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call some of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. <laughs> I called my mama and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn on the radio. I'm about to come on the air. <laughs> I waited for about 20 minutes and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, 
I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you not work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I got rock out of the chair. I put a fast record on by Stevie Wonder called Fingertips, his <laughs> first hit. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and indubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. You gotta be hungry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing that, 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 that for years I've listened to and now I can't I've been get it, that I get for it 51 years. Wow. That sounds so, but even at 75, I still enjoy it because I teach speakers. Many times when speakers tell a story, they just run through it. Like yeah, yeah. an artist who's been singing a song so often and they just improvise. Yep. You know, my former wife's Gladys Knight. And she does a song. Your former wife has got his night. Yes, I used to be the conductor of the Midnight Train. Oh, wow. Yes, and so she would sing Midnight Train to Georgia, but yeah. she always did it the same way you bought it. And I love that. And I told her, I admire that about you. And so when you give a speech, you want to always tell it like you're telling it for the first time. Yeah because people in the audience, they're hearing it for the first time. And those who've heard it, they're gonna follow along with you mm -hmm. and they want you to do it the way you did it. Yeah. And so there are people in the audience yesterday, when I was doing it, they were saying, drink, rock, drink. <laughs> they were waiting on me. <laughs> they were with me step to step. And I, I enjoy that when you can come into a room of strangers and, and you can orchestrate an experience and people begin to set back and their shoulders are high and they have this hunger in their eyes. I say, you got to be hungry. And then somebody will say, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this so is epic. I love this so much. I'm like a little kid. That's why I have a Mickey Mouse socks. Please, and I have yeah, a please don't stand down. No. And I have, Mickey, yeah, I got on. You got Mickey, Mickey Mouse, Mouse watch? watch. And I have a Mickey Mouse underwear, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you have to use your imagination. <laughs> You were given a beautiful gift earlier on today, weren't you? The yes. Mickey Mouse puppet. Yes, which is yes. Such a, I love it. Yeah, how, yes. kind, I, how kind. I've got Mickey Mouse. I got a Mickey Mouse <laughs> clock, uh, shower curtains, Maddox, everything. The, the, my kids think that I'm a crazy. I'm just a grown kid, you know. So. But you know what? It's not so bad then when it comes to Christmas and buying gifts because, hey, guess what? Everybody what do you buy knows. a 75-year-old normally? There's right. not much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What do you buy him? Right. Mickey Mouse. Yes. <laughs> That's excellent stuff. Guys, your relationship to me is beautiful. And I, I, I love spending time with you. Honestly, we've just got to know each other over the last couple mm -hmm. of days and it's been a real blessing. So thank you. thank you so much for coming to Dubai. Thank you so much for sharing what you share and for continuing to inspire so, so many people. Thank, thank you. you, Spencer. We appreciate you yes. and the work oh, that you're doing. And it's an honor to know you. Thank you so much. Yes, and I mean, I, I want to know more about your story and your family and being missionaries in, in Nigeria. Yeah. Judge people not by what they do, but what they do that they don't have to do. And to judge the true quality of what they do, nobody's looking. You come from greatness, and it's my honor to be in your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I really sir. appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank yes. you very much for your time yes. today. Thank you. I want to give you a hug. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can Thanks. I have a hug and kiss? You can have a hug and kiss. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be and, left out. And, <laughs> and he burped me too. <laughs> yes. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Well, there you have it. What an epic episode of the podcast. I can't tell you how excited I was to get Les on the show, but also how humbled I've been with such a lovely, adorable guy that's taken his daughter with him on a journey. She's now publicly speaking on stage, motivating millions of people. Look, Les Brown is a legend and everyone that was part of this episode is totally awestruck by what a lovely guy he is. Look, 
If you want to see other episodes, you can click over there, no problem at all, okay? You can get them if you want, but I'd love you to click there and subscribe to the show. And if you click there and subscribe to the show where I'm pointing right now, you're going to get every episode coming to you and you'll be able to enjoy all of these interviews just as much as I have. So why don't you click over there and get it done? I'll see you soon.